Thank you. Now, can you hear me? Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I appreciate being here today. Okay, that works. Um, besides doing a lot of other things, I serve as a consultant to several law firms in the United States involved in glyphosate litigation. However, today I'm here as a private citizen to express my opinion on the issues before this committee. There are three, mo three main points I will be addressing during this presentation. I will return to them at the end of my talk. I don't have enough time to go over them now. The evaluation of the scientific evidence for any substance involves three major classes of data, epidemiology studies, experimental animal cancer studies, and mechanistic studies. In 15 minutes, I do not have time to cover all of these data, so I will focus on the animal cancer bioassays to illustrate some key points I'd like to make. Typical animal cancer bioassays will expose animals, generally rats and mice, to a chemical for a substantial portion of their lifetime, then kill the animal and examine its organs and tissues for tumors. There are guidelines on how to conduct and analyze these studies. Studies generally use four groups of animals, one group receiving no exposure, we call that the control group, and the remaining three groups are test animals, which each group receiving different doses of the chemical. The studies are conducted in such a way that, control, that controls for everything in the in animal's environment, leaving only the exposure to explain differences in tumor formation between controls and exposed animals. There are 21 total animal carcinogenicity studies available for evaluating the carcinogenicity of glyphosate. Most reviews have <coughs> concluded that nine of these studies have limitations that exclude them from consideration, leaving just 12 studies for the evaluation. There are seven studies in rats and five studies in mice. They were conducted at different times spanning 26 years. They used different strains. They exposed the animals for different durations. Um, all of these factors can affect the results and must be carefully included in any evaluation. There have been a large number of reviews of glyphosate over the years. I will begin my discussion of these data by first looking to see what tumors and what studies have been relied upon for what review. Um, these six evaluations will be the focus of this discussion. I have grouped the EFSA and ECHA reviews together since they seem to use, seem to use this, the exact same tumors. So let's start with the first one. In 2013, the German BFR released their renewal assessment report on glyphosate. They discussed two findings in male mice, malignant lymphomas from two different studies. In this slide, the M after malignant lymphoma stands for male, and later I'll put <coughs> Fs in there for females so you know what sex they are. I might not mention it. They did not discuss any tumors from the earliest studies, but simply referred the reader back to the evaluations that had already been done. I will go through these various reviews one at a time sequentially and show you what I learned as I read these reviews. This point in the upper right-hand corner where it says two tells you how many tumors now have been discovered up to that point in the evaluation process. In early 2015, Grime and colleagues published a review of these studies with funding from industry. In addition to the malignant lymphomas seen in the RAR report, they also noted increases in kidney tumors, lung tumors, and malignant lymphomas in a third mile study. In this table, the blocks in red represent the tumor sites that were not discussed in the report, and X indicates it was dis discussed. For example, the RAR did not discuss positive findings for lung adenocarcinomas in the 2009 study, but Grime and colleagues did. In 2015, IARC reviewed some of the animal carcinogenicity data for glyphosate, but not all of the data due to restrictions on what the information from these studies was available. IARC discussed three tumor sites in mice finding hemangiosarcomas in a 1993 study that had not been discussed previously. So after IARC, we're now up to seven tumors in the mouse studies. <coughs> in, two th in 2015 and in 2017, EFSA and ECHA released their final evaluations of the glyphosate literature. 
They did not discuss the lung adenocarcinoma's findings from the 2009 study, but did discuss all of the other findings. They identified two additional tumors in the 1997 study that had not been discussed previously. That now brings the total up to nine tumor sites. EPA in 2016 released their draft issue paper on glyphosate. EPA did not discuss three of the previously identified tumor findings, but one additional tumor that had not been discussed previously, hemangiomas in female mice in the 2009 study. So now we're up to 10 tumors. In the last two years, I have systematically grown, gone through these data to identify any statistically significant findings that might have been missed in the other evaluations. I found three additional tumors that had not been discussed in any of the previous evaluations, bringing our total to 13 tumors. Of the total of 13 tumor findings that should have been identified and addressed by EFS and ECA, they only discuss eight. The same sort of evaluation can be done for rat studies. Here, there are a larger number of studies and hence a larger number of tumor sites with a significant increase in tumors as a function of glyphosate exposure. In this case, there are seven tumors not discussed in any of the evaluations, and EFSA and ECA have only discussed nine of the 21 total tumors. The full set of slides for the rat studies are available as extra slides attached to this deck. So to summarize, there are a total of 34 tumors in these 12 studies that should have been identified and discussed. Ten of these statistically significant tumor findings have not been discussed in any of the existing reviews. EFSA and ECA discussed exactly half of the statistically significant tumor sites in these studies. EPA was not much better, only discussing 18 of the 34 sites. You may ask yourself, why is this so important? Findings of st statistical significance are one of the key factors used to determine which tumors are increasing as the dose of glyphosate is increased. A lot of other issues need to be considered to decide if that finding is a real finding or just due to random chance. But if you don't know that glyphosate increases the risk of getting the tumor, you won't know to look at those particular tumors. In their response to my letter of May 28th this year to President Juncker, EFSA and ECA stated that they do not routinely examine the original study reports in depth for additional tumors. I assume they also do not reanalyze the data. Um, without reanalyzing the data, they're assuming that the presentation of the data by the industry contract lab is both accurate and comprehensive. If it is not, as it is in this case, the results are likely to be biased in favor of fewer significant tumor findings. It is not possible for me to discuss all of these different tumors in 15-minute presentation. So instead, I will focus on hematopoietic system tumors, <coughs> since NHL in humans falls into this category. NHL is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the finding that IARC had for limited evidence. Um, are any of these tumors similar to NHL in humans? These are all hematopoietic hematopoietic system tumors in the mice. Let's look at that. 85% of the tumors that make up the class of NHL are B-cell lymphomas, with the largest subclass of B-lymphomas being diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. If you study the literature broader than just glyphosate, you see that B-cell lymphomas in mice are used as a model for B-cell lymphomas in humans. This means that the two diseases are close enough in phenotype and function that if, for example, you wanted to develop a new therapy for B-cell lymphoma in humans, you would first use the mouse to see if it is both efficacious and safe. Since B-cell lymphomas in mice are classified as malignant lymphomas, this tumor is very close matched to NHL in humans. Thus, there is a strong biological link between the two. Did I just do two? Um, both EFSA and ECA, there. Both EFSA and ECA concluded that malignant lymphomas in mice were not caused by glyphosate. They gave several reasons. First, they conclu concluded that tumors fall, fall within the range of historical rates of these tumors in control animals and should be excluded. For any given study, the most appropriate control is the concurrent control. And I will talk about this a little more later. 
But generally, while the OECD guidelines on how to conduct and analyze these studies talk about a number of more rigorous analyses for historical controls, they do allow for some informal evaluations. However, they warn against the use of the range of historical control evaluations because it can be very misleading and mischaracterize a positive finding as negative. They suggest a different approach using the interquartile range. And in this case, the findings in the experiments showing increases in malignant lymphomas are outside of the range of the historical control response. Another reason to exclude results was seeing no significant pairwise comparisons. This is actually not surprising <laughs> since the trend test generally has much higher ability to identify a positive finding that is real than does a pairwise test. Most agencies, however, will reject chance if either test is positive. Another reason they give for excluding, excluding, <laughs> excluding these findings is that there was potential general toxicity in the highest dose group in the 1997 study. Toxicity would present itself as either an increase in mortality in a group, the animals die early, or a significant reduction in body weight, but without a significant reduction in food consumption. Many times at the high dose, the food doesn't taste that well and the animals don't eat as much. As shown in EFSA's evaluation, that has not happened here. Another reason they give for excluding these findings is that the results were only positive in males and not in females. However, there are many carcinogens that are positive in only one sex, such as the known human carcinogen for amino biphenyl. The final reason they give for excluding these findings is that they are not consistent across the four studies. Here I provide you with the actual tumor data for the four studies. Now several things should be noted in this table. First, there are studies of 18 months duration and studies of 24 months duration. Why does this matter? Well, just like humans, as mice age, they get more tumors just by chance. Comparing tumor rates in mice exposed to 18 months versus those exposed to 24 months is similar to comparing tumor rates in 55-year-old humans to tumor rates in 75-year-old humans. They are indeed very different. The second thing to notice is that the two 18-month studies are the most recent studies, and those studies range over 26 years. A lot can change in 26 years. How you house the animals, the type of bedding, the feed, the genetics of the animals, etc., all change over time. This is one of the reasons the concurrent control is the most appropriate. It received the same diet. It received the same housing. It was in the same bedding, and it was, has the same genetics as the animals in the treated groups. Clearly, the 18-month studies here, are the, studies, the results are highly statistically significant. The pooled analysis demonstrates agreement between the studies. On a simple pooling of the data into the larger data set and also on a much more complicated general linear model. The 24-month studies appear to be different, although one of them is almost statistically significant. To summarize, I hope I have provided evidence supporting my three points. The current process is scientifically flawed. It is time to have an independent panel of scientists evaluate the way, evaluate the way in which the science is reviewed. There is a need for the regulatory agencies to reanalyze the data, and there is a need to public, publicly release all of the analyses and data to improve the transparency of this process. The issues I raised here are not all of the issues I have found with the assessments, but demonstrate some of them. This was just the evaluation for carcinogenicity. What about reproductive toxicity? What about developmental toxicity? I can't answer that question because I don't have the data for those areas and I can't reevaluate it. In addition, what about the 450 plus other pesticides that have been reviewed? If there's one thing that's clear to me, after 2.5 years after the IARC review, the one thing that's clear is had not IARC done this review, today I would be not here, I would not be here telling you that half the tumors were missed in the reviews that I was looking at. I would not be here to tell you that I'm very concerned that this process is scientifically flawed. Thank you very much. <laughs>